Uh, so today's guest is uh, Stacy Brown Pilpot, who serves as the CEO of TaskRabbit, a marketplace that matches freelance labor uh, with local demand, allowing consumers to find immediate help for everyday tasks. Stacy's also on the board of HP and Nordstrom, and most recently was announced as a founding member of SoftBank's $100 million growth, uh, opportunity growth fund dedicated to investing in black and, and minority owned businesses. Uh, prior to joining, uh, prior to becoming CEO of TaskRabbit uh, in 2013, Stacy spent 10 years at Google and before that she was at PwC and Goldman Sachs. So amazing track record um, of innovation and, and working across tech. So uh, Adam, uh, would love to love to hop into the next yeah. part. So we're, we, I mean, we're, we're especially excited to talk to Stacy today. She's one of the original pioneers of internet enabled peer to peer marketplaces. Uh, personally, as one of uh, TaskRabbit's first and most active users and still a pretty active one, uh, I've always been really impressed by her vision around the future of work and how people are organized. Uh, in, in full disclosure, Stacy's uh, and also an investor in our project here called Brain Trust. Uh, so Stacy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, one thing you probably didn't know, I think it was maybe a couple of years before your time, I think when, when Leah was getting it off the ground, uh, was that in the early days of TaskRabbit, Leah actually knew me by name um, because I was like this super user in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> and so apparently I was like top five in all of San Francisco. That's awesome. Uh, and, and it's it's been a fantastic service for those of us that I, I always refer to myself as like productively lazy. Yeah. Um, so I like can accomplish so many things. And, and one of the things I always use TaskRabbit for, my wife made fun of me about this in the very beginning, was uh, was to create forcing functions for myself. Like I'm actually perfectly capable of cleaning out my garage or organizing like that closet that I've never organized. Um, but if I hire somebody that comes to my house and actually like helps me to do it, uh, the chances of it getting done go through the roof. Um, there so you go. <laughs> Adam and I have both been uh, long-term power users of, of TaskRabbit um, from the from the very early days. So well, exciting we, to see how you guys have grown since then. Well, thank you for being customers. We hope we've we've changed your life in some meaningful way through TaskRabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and probably kept a lot of marriages together as a result of not having to put together IKEA furniture. Yes. Um, <laughs> Well, our mission is to make everyday life easier for everyday people. So we certainly made <laughs> furniture assembly a whole lot easier for a lot of people. <laughs> so you, you've had a super interesting career from, you know, from management consulting, you know, finance, and then into tech at Google. Talk to me a little bit about your path to becoming CEO of TaskRabbit and, and kind of like what, what appealed to you to move from a place like Google to, in, to you know, being CEO of like a localized labor marketplace? Yeah, well, I started my career in finance. So I was an accountant by training. Um, I actually worked in public accounting and then later in investment banking before business school and after business school went to Google. So I've always been interested in, you know, how numbers and math and how things work. Um, I've also been interested in how businesses grow and scale. Um, yeah. I was fortunate to join Google, you know, early on at a thousand people. So it wasn't super tiny. And uh, it grew to 50,000 over the nine years that I was there. And during that time, I started my career as a financial analyst and grew into more senior roles, moved into operations and went to run our team in India. And across all of that, built my leadership skills as someone who could manage initially 14 people you know, to over a thousand people. And I fell in love with a lot of things. Just one is just growing and scaling teams, um, helping people develop and grow and become their best selves as individuals and yep. building global companies. Uh, I worked on the consumer side of Google for a lot of my career, which is all the products you know and love like Chrome and Gmail and Maps and mm -hmm. all of those things. And I just have this penchant for consumer, you know, consumer facing products and services. So a lot of my career was sort of building myself as a leader, falling in love with just consumer products and services and doing yep. it at a global level. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't easy to leave Google. Yeah. Google was, you know, an amazing experience with a powerful mission, 
but I fell in love with the mission of TaskRabbit, which is to make everyday life easier for everyday people. And that mm -hmm. mission is what drew me to take this new company that's in a new space around the future of work and yep. grow it to a global scale. Wow. It, so it, Adam and I actually, we, we met geez, over 10 years ago um, as like marketplace entrepreneurs. And we, we joked that like we, we met like while we would cry into our beers together about the challenges of, of essentially building two companies at once hmm. um, and building a marketplace which serves both sides. And, and so Adam and I have both been long-term marketplace founders and then investors. Um, it, one of the things I, I don't think that a lot of people realize about, mar about uh, a, a marketplace like TaskRabbit is, is actually the, the other dimensions that you have to a localized marketplace. So you have like this dimension of geographic constraint then yes. you also have a dimension of, of category, meaning you're in 30 different categories. So you have to have density of demand and supply across yes. all of these different categories. And then you also have this other dimension of time. Yes. Um, and so I, I'd love for you to kind of talk about those dimensions. And, and I think this is probably an area of your background in finance uh, really kind of comes into play to build liquidity in a marketplace. Uh, so yeah. love to kind of get your your take on those challenges and, and maybe how you've navigated them as CEO. Yeah, so that's an, it, I love that framing of geography, category, and, and time. And what what all of that does is you end up you forces you to build micro markets, um, really small micro local markets. And in the end, you know you, we look at the health of a market by zip code. I mean, we're literally down to the zip code of do we have enough taskers to provide these types of services in this uh, zip code at this time for the customer. Yep. But it wasn't easy to get to that place because geography means, you know, we were operating in nine cities when I started and Leah started the company in one city in Boston, right? And we had to yeah. make that market work before we could expand yep. to new markets. And even yep. expanding to new markets, there's a lot of similarities, at least in our marketplace, that are, you know, yes, this works in every market, the quality yep. of the taskers, for example. But there's some things that just don't work. A lot of people take public transportation to most tasks in New York. Yep. And so a lot of tasks like can't be done if someone has a car. In London, where we ultimately went, there's a tax to drive your car into the city in certain areas <laughs> in London. And so people would hire taskers because yep. they didn't want to have to drive their car. So there's all the nuances of a local market yep. that have to be applied to adapt to a marketplace. Um, yep. And so that's one thing that, you know, you can't just blanket the market with the same thing because yep. the nuances completely matter. Yeah, we have huge, huge respect for for what you do there, building a localized labor marketplace with all those different variables. I mean, at Brain Trust, you know, we, we connect global enterprises with technical talent. So you have category, but it, but geography really isn't an issue. Um, and also, like, someone showing up at 6 p.m. is not really an issue. So it's, mm -hmm. you have these other dimensions which just make the business both really valuable, but also very challenging. So huge, huge respect for, for what you guys are doing to be able to scale that business. Yeah, the category piece is interesting. We used to offer TaskRabbit to everybody for anything. And yeah. that was really hard because we could I remember, not I remember that time. fill yeah. all of the demand yeah. because we just yeah. didn't have enough people. It was very yep. hard to predict. And yep. so we shifted the model in 2014 to yep. limit the number of categories yep. and really focus on making sure we had high quality supply in those categories. Yeah. Even yeah, still, definitely. it's not always clear yeah. what I can get done on TaskRabbit, yeah. but we know that now we provide services for people in and around the home. So you yep. can kind of put your head around that and find something uh, find a tasker who can help you. I, I remember when you guys did that. It was, uh, I remember actually, that, that's actually when I first met you, uh, was mm -hmm. actually when you were, you were kind of consolidating categories to build more liquidity and density in those categories. Yes. And that seems like it's really when the business started to really take off. Um, so anyway, yeah, that I remember, I remember that change, uh, yes. both as a user and also that's the first time we met. So. Very good. Stacey, uh, th this is actually a good segue. Uh, one of the things I've always been impressed by 
with TaskRabbit is, um, and, and it's quite an issue these days, maybe even more so now, is sort of this topic of ethics of marketplaces. Mm -hmm. You see other platforms like Uber and DoorDash, which have been criticized probably fairly so for, you know, effectively squashing the minimum wage and removing some worker rights and like keeping tips, you know, and crazy stuff like that. And um, what, what's your view on responsibility of marketplaces to their users? Yeah. I, I love the phrase ethics. Uh, TaskRabbit is a, two, a true two-sided marketplace, mm -hmm. which means we really want to balance what our clients need and want to get done and how they want to engage with the marketplace with what our taskers need and want to get done in terms of how they find work on the platform. Mm -hmm. And our mission is to make everybody's everyday life easier, including our taskers. And to yeah. make that happen, we've got to make sure they earn a meaningful income, that they have the resources that they need to be successful on the platform. So even when COVID-19 hit, we provided PPE to taskers for free at no cost yeah. because we wanted them to be safe if they were going to go out and task. Um, and so by doing that, we really put our taskers at the center of the story uh, and make sure that even as a client has an experience, the experience is with TaskRabbit, the platform, but it's also with the tasker who's showing up yeah. and providing that experience to you. It's a relationship and we're encouraging them to think about it that way. And I think that that solves the question of ethics. Like this is a people powered platform that's connecting individuals. And when you, when you, when we talk about it that way, there's some humanity that comes in and it forces us as a company to have the ethics, have the approach, have the processes to make sure that everybody on the platform is treated fairly. Yeah. I mean, Stacey, I, I, I guess I've never heard you quoted saying, you know, when this business will really take off is when we can replace the taskers with robots. <laughs> <laughs> to famously quote someone else in the uh, gig. Yes, well, <laughs> there's just some things the robots can't do. Not yet, but maybe. <laughs> they, don't have a, they, don't, they don't have these for IKEA furniture, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> twisting, I mean, twisting the little keys, yeah. Yeah, this is this is one of those categories where I, I this is like people helping people, right? I just don't see that changing yeah. anytime soon. Yeah. Um, I mean, keep, keeping along this thread, what, what responsibility do you think marketplaces have in promoting diversity? Sort of like, what are some concrete things that other marketplaces can do, you know, on this diversity and inclusion effort? Do we lose you, Stacey? So we froze there for a second. Yeah, internet might have frozen. Yeah. Or she just hates that, my question. <laughs> uh, what a perfect question to freeze on. I know. <laughs> like, uh, you know, they say like there's the, uh, you have like the, some, sometimes you, you can freeze in questions, but this is like, a, that's, a, that's so funny. Sorry, you nope. got disconnected. I don't know what happened. <laughs> no we were just joking. We we're like, what a perfect question to freeze on. Did, did you yeah. did you did you hear my question? I heard the question. But okay. I was like talking and then it just said connected. We we were kind of like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> but you asked a question about diversity, and yeah. uh, let me let me answer that. And I was gonna I started by saying. Diversity is paramount now, um, especially now more than ever, ever, but we've always thought about that in how we've built the yeah. TaskRabbit marketplace. We've always wanted it to reflect the population in which we operate. Like it it mm -hmm. really should. And we wanted to make sure that underserved populations have opportunities to task on TaskRabbit that might not otherwise have them. And so, you know, one of the benefits of being a marketplace is that people can see your ratings and your reviews, and they can select a tasker based on the quality of the work that they've done. Yep. And that 
provides a lot of equality in ways that other employment opportunities might not. Yep. We it's started, it, yeah. go ahead. You and so, Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Keep going. We started Task Fabric for Good uh, a few years ago, and one of our projects has actually been working with workforce development agencies hmm. to identify populations of people that might not consider TaskRabbit as a way to return to work if you're homeless or as a way to start in your career if you need a new sure. start. And so we've extended the work that we're doing to try to increase the number of taskers from those populations as well. And I, that's another element of diversity that often gets overlooked, but is also extremely important to sort of building economic equity in our in our country, in our world. And some, of the, some of these other marketplaces, like I, I know that Airbnb looked at this, which was like the, the idea of blinding matches. Um, so like not showing profile photos, not showing names. Um, have you guys looked into that at all? Or, or do you have any thoughts and perspective about how marketplaces can make matches, but um, but not provide or, or like remove uh, potential bias in the match? Yeah, we are constantly looking at ways to address bias on, on our platform. Yeah. And I'm aware of the things that Airbnb has done. Um, some of the things that we've looked at and we've, we're iterating, we're constantly testing and iterating uh, are blind matches. And a lot of times when you get a IKEA furniture assembly, you don't know who the tasker is that's going to show up. Yeah. But you just know it's an expert in the things that you bought because we actually look at what you buy, what's in your cart, and we decide who the tasker is gonna be that's gonna show up at that time. And most customers, they just want the job done. And they trusted our platform, they trusted TaskRabbit oh. had to really tackle it in a significant way, fortunately. That's that. That's you. You took my next question out of my mouth. There, I was wondering about what which systems were you, you were using to to make sure that works. That that's brilliant. Um, and it, so, sort of wrapping up on the marketplace topic, let's talk about the future of marketplaces. I mean, so you've been you've been in, you've been scaling TaskRabbit here for a number of years you, through the I, IKEA acquisition. H how's that going? I know they've they've kind of let you know let you keep the reins and run with it. Well, like, what does the future look like for TaskRabbit? Yeah, we have, we have really been thrilled with, our, with having IKEA as a partner to us. We launched yeah. a partnership with them in one store in London in uh, December of 2016, a year mm -hmm. after we met the team. And that was successful and it led to the acquisition. And now we operate TaskRabbit in six countries. And you know what's really worked is that both companies have very powerful missions. Our mission is to make everyday life easier for everyday people. Theirs is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And they wrote theirs like over 75 years ago, ours is over 10 years ago, but the alignment there is, is, is so powerful. We also have shared values of caring about the community in which we operate. And so it makes it easy for us to truly operate as a two-sided marketplace, even though we're this sort of independent entity within IKEA. And so that gave us a nice grounding for how do we really accelerate what we do? They didn't buy our company just to let us sort of continue to do what we're doing. They really wanted to accelerate the opportunity for IKEA customers to have a better experience and also attract more IKEA customers sure. to IKEA who might not otherwise come or yep. might not otherwise add something to their cart because they don't want to have to put it together. And so we've seen our business go from less than 2% IKEA furniture assembly to over 20% IKEA wow. furniture assembly, even as the business is, our business has grown by more than 50% every year, which is amazing. Uh, we're very proud of the new customers who are trying TaskRabbit for the first time through IKEA. And we're very proud to be in a position where we are creating a more convenient and high quality experience for IKEA customers. I mean, it, re it really strikes me as like, you, I mean, so, so many acquisitions, as you know, if, you, if you've been in the Valley long <laughs> enough, like they just don't make sense. Or even if they yeah. sound like they make sense, they don't work out. I've, I've been yeah. on both sides of those. Um, this is one where it really truly was like, wow, that 
made a lot of sense and actually worked out. So congrats on that. A lot of respect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, Stacey, kind of transitioning a little bit more onto the investing side um, and, and maybe future marketplaces there, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, SoftBank announced that they were creating this $100 million uh, opportunity growth fund focused on investing in, in companies led by uh, people of color. Um, and and with, with less than 1% of venture capital going to African-American founders, clearly this is an important mission and, and one really that needs serious funding to start to balance. Um, what are the areas that that you're excited about kind of helping and you're on you're on the board of that as a as one of two people helping to shepherd that organization can you talk a little bit about kind of areas that that you think are maybe underappreciated or undercovered marketplace opportunities um, potentially in in groups of uh, in in my ethnic minorities or, or groups of color that are building businesses in categories that maybe don't seem obvious to the classic silicon valley venture community yeah, so we're still in the very early stages of building out the fund. And mm -hmm. it came together because of the moment that we're in, the time that we're in, and the need to yeah. take action. Our yeah. focus is on Black, Latinx, and Native American founders and entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who are building tech and tech-enabled services, of which marketplaces would fit. A lot of what yep. we're trying to do is look across the country in the U.S. to identify those founders who might not otherwise have an opportunity or have access to Silicon Valley. Yep. And so while I don't have a lot of the details, I can tell you that, that that's what the priority is. I do believe that marketplaces and other tech-enabled services are the future for our mm -hmm. economy. When you look yeah. at the number of jobs that have been lost, a lot of them are service oriented jobs and then the, and, and the economy is suffering because of it. And so yep. we deeply understand the importance of those services. We also deeply understand the importance of marketplaces like ours that are giving people the opportunity to become independent contractors yep. who can now have a flexible way of working. So there's meaningful work on TaskRabbit. The average hourly rate is $35 in the US. Um, it's flexible and the importance of flexibility is only gonna change even as we navigate our life post, post COVID-19. Yeah. So yep. you, you think about essential services, the platforms and marketplaces that are enabled, using tech to enable those services will be yep. the essential services. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Stacy, you invested in Brain Trust early on, like when, when Adam and I were just kind of coming up with this idea, deciding to dedicate, like to put everything else aside and, and to dedicate all of our time and energy to, to build this. Like what caught your attention? Like what, you know, why'd you get involved? Yeah, I, as, as someone who knows marketplaces deeply, it was clear that this was a piece of the market that was right for the opportunity to really disaggregate how things are done, to provide companies with a way to access talent, and to do it in a way that gives people the opportunities they wouldn't otherwise get. Like that's, that's a marketplace and that's what you do. Yeah. So that, that opportunity was there, but it was also the two of you, uh, the team. And in the very beginning, that's, that's what it comes down to, is how passionate is the team about what you're doing? How committed are you? And how much grit do you have around taking those steps that no one else wants to take? I often tell people early on, uh, in TaskRabbit's time when it was just Leah, there was like this desert that she was in and nobody else was there and she was walking and nobody knew where she was going, but she knew. And then when I joined, yep. I kind of saw where we were going, but it was unclear. And like, it wasn't clear if there was an oasis with some water in that direction, yeah. but we were still going to go there because we believed that the oasis was there with the water. And yeah. Yeah. We got to it and then we got to the next one and the next one and we made it. And that's the, that's sort of the grit that an early stage founder has to have is the belief yeah. that the Oasis is there and that they'll get there. Yeah. yeah I mean, listen, you know, uh, thank you so much. And, 
you know, Adam and I, we, we joke about this often, uh, which is that like, you know, both of us started a few companies, invested probably in what, 70, 70 companies together. Um, both had, you know, our own venture funds. And like when we came with the idea to start Brain Trust, and, and the idea was basically to create the first user owned, user controlled marketplace, um, we were laughed at a sand hill. Like we did what, Adam? A hundred meetings, yeah, yeah 80, 80, 100 meetings. And, and literally people said, if you want to do anything else, we'll fund you. Uh, just don't do this. Uh, and this was also like in the height of blockchain winter, where basically mm. like not, not a single person wanted to invest in anything that even smelled of blockchain. Um, and so it, it's just always interesting to, to see the people that are there with you early on and, and believe in your vision, even when it sounds crazy. And when, when other people are, are laughing us out of their offices, you know, you backed us. And I, 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 think, uh, I think we're going to make you look uh, <laughs> even smarter than you already look. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, let's uh, maybe switching gears a little bit. And uh, Stacey, you just started touching on this uh, in your previous comment. I wanted to drill a little further. So you, you've got this extremely unique viewpoint uh, especially you know, right now in that we're going through this pandemic and this economic distress. Uh, I mean, you've got this viewpoint of running one of the largest labor marketplaces and sitting on the board of Nordstrom, one of the country's largest retailers, two sectors absolutely disproportionately affected by, by the pandemic. What has that been like, first of all? Yeah. It's been interesting because even HP is disproportionately affected too. So I can give you kind of the arc of the story across all three. Please um, because do. they do a lot of man, HP does a lot of manufacturing in China. They were oh, disproportionately disaffected, affect, affected even when we in the US thought this was just a China thing. <laughs> this was just a thing that's not gonna hit us because it, you know, it impacts their supply chain. Yeah. And while obviously they had inventory, there was a need as a board to think about the forecast and can we meet customer sales? Even if this pandemic never comes or spreads anywhere else, yep. we've got a supply chain challenge. And so the global nature of how we operate businesses and the dependencies that we have on the interdependencies that we have across the globe. If a pandemic hits one country, it affects everybody almost immediately. And since then, you know, HP has, we've worked out the supply chain, it's still some challenges, but we've worked it out, but they've seen a surge in laptop sales because That's everybody right. is working yeah. from home and more importantly, kids are, at home and they all need computers to get onto their zoom and whatever school systems that they were on so that was a huge piece of their business that you know historically people kind of mostly focused on their printing business but they said oh well what about P well wait a minute pcs is is big now because everybody's at home and we need mm -hmm. to sell all the devices and now we need to buy a printer to go with it and in fact no wait we need a home system that we just never thought we needed before. So it's really changed, yeah. you know, the dynamic of how they think about their business. And then they've gone into 3D printing face shields and, and equipment for the face shields around all the millions of people who need them. And so it created a new business opportunity. So I think that's, that's, that's the story for a lot of businesses out there, which is like, there's something that hurt us there's something that's like we're just reacting to and then there's new yep. opportunities that are out there. Nordstrom similarly, you know, has really been hurt by going to zero, meaning like all the stores are closed, but they have a significant business online already through their app. And so they obviously saw a surge of customers shift to shopping online and shopping on the app, which means they had to kind of refactor their supply chain to get goods from another, you might've gone to the store, but now we're going to ship this to another state. Which, well, I'm a big trunk club guy and I know I'm using that much more. Yes, you are. So there you go, right? <laughs> this, this is the exciting part of it. And it's, it's devastating to see, 
the looting and rioting that's happened in a lot of their stores and we're as a board we're all very hurt um, by that and and obviously empathize with the people who are truly trying to peacefully protest um, and 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 help the company kind of navigate through it but there's a lot of new opportunities that are coming for them because of the change in the way that customers are shopping the types of things that we wear when we work yep. from home that we don't wear, you know, when we go to work. <laughs> and there's a lot of opportunities coming from that. And so, and I'll yep. finish with the task habit arc, which was once we found out that we were going to shelter in place, obviously our business is going to be impacted because people go inside your home to provide the yep. tasks. Yep. And so we had to figure out how to adapt and what to do. And our first priority was the protection and the safety of the community. And yeah. so we gave our taskers the information that they needed. And some of them still wanted to task, but we encouraged them to do contactless tasks. So we obviously saw a pickup in those types of tasks, especially deliveries, you know, around groceries, errands, picking up prescriptions and things like that from yeah. pharmacies. Um, and as things started to open up more and more people started to stay home longer than they thought, barbecue grills, trampolines, exercise equipment, <laughs> things that need to be assembled outside, <laughs> home office equipment. So we've yep. seen a new surge of business coming into those categories that otherwise wouldn't have seen that kind of volume. And I think that creates a huge opportunity for us. Yep. So, you know, I think all of us have an arc somewhere and every company is, is, I don't know where they are on that arc. They may be still at the hard part, which is like, whoa, our business has been decimated in this way. And hopefully we all emerge on the arc of, well, we found this new opportunity because of where we are and this is what we're gonna yeah. do next. Yeah. I mean, so so, such an incredible viewpoint you've got there. Just th thank you for sharing that. that that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, Adam and I talk about this a lot, which is that uh, the trend, some of these trends were already underway, right? Like the trend towards remote work, the trend towards distributed teams, the trend towards like, uh, uh, let's say like offline to online. Like mm. these trends were already in play. Um, they just got accelerated by a decade in three months. Yes. Um, and so, you know, whatever, in February, we'd go and talk to a big, big enterprise and they'd say, we need everyone co-located, right? Now, no one can say that. Um, and, and, and that's just one, one simple example about, you know, how they access talent. But we've seen it kind of across the board with companies shifting, their, shifting more of their business to e-commerce uh, from traditional retail. Uh, so I think exactly, exactly what you're saying. Um, I want to shift to like a fun little lightning round. Uh, where we do just like some kind of one sentence, quick, quick answers, uh, cool. you know, first, first kind of things that come to your head. So uh, first is, what have you learned about yourself during shelter in place? I miss being around people a whole lot. <laughs> Amen. I do. <laughs> I, I people other than our families. I know it's like, yeah, totally. but I, I describe myself as an introvert often and I am an introvert, but there's a, yeah. something about going into a room with like other humans in there breathing the same air that I just yeah. am working together that I just miss. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the old way, what, what, what's an old way of working kind of a pre COVID p component of working that you hope never comes back? Ooh. Um, traveling for two day conferences. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hard to argue with that. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so, you know, Silicon Valley has always been this like incredibly dense concentration of talent and capital and innovation. Um, and, and so much of it is, is, you know, been working in offices in, in, this tiny kind of little uh, 30, 40 mile uh, circumference. Uh, post COVID, Silicon Valley on the way up or on the way down? Up, on the way up. Why? This is still a place where innovation happens. And I sit on the governor's uh, task force to reopen the state and there's a lot of people across 
you know, private sector, public sector, kind of having discussions to really, you know, support the conversation for how do we make these decisions. And it is amazing to me that the people in the private sector who are represented from Silicon Valley tech, like the ideas that we have are forward thinking. And so we may not physically be here in Silicon Valley, but the mentality of moving forward and being forward thinking is something that is in us as, as people and, and what drew us to these types of work environments. And I don't think we'll lose that. That's, it's, it's almost a contrarian viewpoint right now. <laughs> I mean, people are so down on the Bay Area right now. Well, it's expensive people will move and I'm sure a lot of your employees are like, we want to live somewhere else that's cheaper. Um, and so that's, that's a reason to be disheartened about the future of Silicon Valley. But if we think about the essence of what this place is really about, when I grew up in Detroit, I had heard about California and Stanford and Silicon Valley. And it was this place where all these ideas came from. And I want nothing more than for Silicon Valley to be that, to continue to be that place where ideas can come from. Now, ideas will come from everywhere else all over the country, but I don't think we'll lose that part. People will move though. They definitely will move. <laughs> I, 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 I tend to agree. I mean, th there's, there's got to be a place for the Larry and Sergey's and Elons of the world to land, and that's been Stanford, right? And and the country and our society are, are better for it. I think that that they came here and as opposed to somewhere else. Um, not the next one. Uh, so, Stacey, if you could fast forward any specific business, not necessarily by name, just the function of the business, by five years, what would it be and why? Hmm. I would say elderly care. Hmm. So if you think about what's happening right now, care for, and as we grow up as a generation, for elderly and our children, like we become sandwiched. And we just haven't really figured out how to do that well. And yeah. so I would, I would accelerate how we think about care, how we think about care for elderly, how do we think about care for our children, so that those of us who are now building companies, running companies, doing things can really truly manage that. Um, and I'm sitting in the center of it. I'm watching it and there just aren't really any good solutions around it. Yeah. Still feels like a, a amazing marketplace opportunity that still like hasn't even really scratched the surface there. Yeah. Right. Like both of those have to be like two of the single largest labor markets in the world. Um, yes. and have really haven't been solved yet. So for There's entrepreneurs, so much there inequity between yeah. how much the care providers make with yep. the value that they provide totally. to the people receiving the service. This is it's a perfect opportunity for kind of like, yes. uh, yeah, just uh, disintermediating that all of that margin that's sitting between there and, and actually provide a better quality of service um, for a fraction of the cost, which is like, I think what Silicon, part of what Silicon Valley is all about, right? Yes. Um, is building technology to do those things that typically hierarchies have done and done in really in poor fashion. So uh, my hope also is that that, that old model of, uh, of elderly care moves from a hierarchy to a network um, where, where everyone gets more value. Yes. Um, all right. What's the company uh, that you wish you invested in in the future work besides Zoom and Braintrust? <laughs> <laughs> um. I was an early adopter of Amazon mom and with, that doesn't even exist anymore. And I wish I had bought the stock when it was when Amazon mom, which became Amazon prime 
was a thing. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody even knows what Amazon mom is, but I remember being like this early, they're like, do you want us to like give you a discount and free delivery if you sign up? And I was like, sure, I'm a new mom. And I didn't yeah. buy this. <laughs> so I <wish> I <laughs> that's, that's a good one. Uh, uh, final one here, Stacey. This, this one's from one of my favorite people, Peter Thiel. What, what's something you believe strongly to be true that's a very unpopular viewpoint today? Well, I, I would, I think what's becoming popular now and is the topic of racism. And as a black woman, I have experienced racism my whole life. And while I've never had anybody put their knee on my neck physically, it's happened in other ways. And so the acknowledgement that racism against black people is a thing, it is present, it is present among us, it is systemic, is very real to me. It has been real to me my whole life. And it's, it's not popular to feel it. And especially if you're not black, it's definitely not popular to acknowledge it and to feel it. But in order for us to heal and move forward, we have to feel it. We have to grieve it. And then we have to find a way to heal and move forward. So I'm encouraged that what's happening with the protests and the actions that are happening as a result of them are going to result in some real meaningful change. Uh, and I hope that it really does. I mean, the, 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 the murder of Mr. Floyd, it, 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 feel, it feels different this time. It feels more historic for, from my standpoint, which doesn't mean anything, but does it feel different from your standpoint? It doesn't feel different for me. Yeah. Um, it is, it's happened to so many people like him. It yeah. just was never televised that way. Yep. What feels different is the number of people and the diversity of people around the world who are standing up and saying that this is wrong. And that feels different to my mother. I can't say me because I was like a little kid back in the 60s. Yeah. But when I talked to her, she's like, no, that part, that part is different. We yeah. were alone in the 60s. And now everybody is standing up. And that's what's different. And that's good. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, this is my last one. I'm just going to slip in here. Um, when when can we see run for governor of California? <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm like a baby because I'm and on our task force. I'm still learning vocabulary. You know, I would say like businesses and our company and they're like, OK, so the private sector. I was like, oh, OK, got it. <laughs> So, you know, let me learn my ABCs uh, first, okay? And then we can talk about something else. <laughs> I, you we know, got two votes here. Two votes. Yeah. Uh, oh, you I, I, right now. I, I imagine there's there's millions more where yeah. that came from. Uh, yeah. It's nothing against Newsom, I guess. But, um, boy, you'd be a hell of a leader. Uh, you're <laughs> just putting it out there. Um, anyway... <laughs> Thank you, Stacey, so much for being here. Uh, this this was such a treat to have you on the on the uh, show and hear your your amazing experience and this incredible perch you sit from uh, and, and seeing how things are are working right now. Thank you um, so yeah. much. Where can people uh, reach you and find out more about you? Uh, LinkedIn. I'm faster on LinkedIn. Yes. We're that's we're it. big LinkedIn fans. It's uh, yeah. that's a that's a post COVID thing too, right? Like LinkedIn's kind of it a big is. thing now, right? I, I am more <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn more now than ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Us too. Us yeah. too. Yeah. Same. Same. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Well, great. Awesome.